Hola. Oh, very good. My name is Andres Tapia. I grew up in Lima, Peru. My dad, Peruvian, Fernando Andres Tapia Mendieta Gavino. My mom, American, Jackie K. Grant. From a tiny town called Harrington, Washington, 50 miles west of Spokane, in the Pacific Northwest United States. While growing up in the Southern Hemisphere, I would foray into the Northern Hemisphere to visit my American grandparents. And many years later, as I moved to the U.S. for college, and I've been here ever since, I now do forays into the Southern Hemisphere to visit my homeland and my family there. Now, that my biography is relevant backdrop to the topic I'm going to share with you today, which is about upside-down diversity, which is insights that I have. But before I do that, um, I want to talk about why upside-down diversity. There is a sense that diversity is as, or even more relevant than ever before. It's urgent. And yet, perhaps that diversity, let's call it diversity 1.0, has run its course, has taken us as far as it can. It is not as relevant. It feels stretched and pushed in ways that do not address contemporary society. So we're going to look at upside-down diversity. But before we do that, let's look at the context. Isn't the world overall upside-down? So much of every arena of life, you know, the best practices don't seem to work anymore. They actually seem to give us the opposite solutions and conclusions that we seek for. For example, isn't the world upside down in terms of the financial systems? Who would have thought that what happens in Athens, Greece would have an overnight impact on the Dow Jones Industrial Stock Index? The current paralysis in Washington is indicative that there is recognition that we are in dire economic straits, but no agreement about the way forward. And every one of us has felt the shock of the Great Recession in one way or the other. Isn't the world upside down in terms of health care? Regardless of one's own personal opinion about health care reform, it's changing the landscape. But we don't know in what ways, in terms of how things get paid for, how much things will cost, how we'll be insured. And technology is prolonging life, which is great, but is raising ethical dilemmas that we've never faced before. Isn't the world upside down in terms of manufacturing? Gone are many of the dirty, polluting factories that uh, contaminated our waterways and our airways, and they're being replaced by clean, green, LEED-certified, robot-run factories. Unfortunately, they employ a lot fewer people, and even the people that employ many times need a college education to run the assembly line. Isn't the world upside down in terms of how we connect with one another? Right now, you're tweeting and blogging and texting to friends and family and colleagues halfway around the world or just across the aisle here in the theater. It's a whole new way of connecting. Isn't the world upside down in terms of what is an economic superpower? Not too long ago, we referred to third world backward nations of Brazil, India, and China. And yet now, they're rising economic powers that are pulling millions of people out of poverty every year and vying for economic supremacy with the United States. So in this upside down, post 9-11, post boomer, post American, post modern, post economic boom world, how do we prepare ourselves? And where is it that diversity and inclusion can have compelling answers to these vexing questions? Now, before we can look at that, we need to look at the ways in which diversity itself is upside down. For instance, to be young is to be experienced. I mean, think about it. Who has more experience with technology? And in the United States, who has more experience with economic and political instability? You know, for the baby boomers, after the tumultuous 60s, it was a pretty predictable existence. You could predict your salary increases on a regular basis, on a yearly way. If you're on a career track, you can predict your cadence of your promotions. You could predict your retirement estate with an 85% probability. So even though millennials have been hardest hit by the Great Recession economically, it's been boomers that have been hardest hit psychologically. They're trying to figure out what happened to the world in which I learned to be successful in. When boomers were in their 20s, they were the counterculture. Millennials are the culture. When boomers turn 30, they're mainstream. Millennials are the mainstream. How they shop, how they connect, how they look for information, how they seek jobs, how they connect with one another is how the world is today and only moving most rapidly in that direction. So to be young is to experience. Diversity is upside down. To be a minority is to be a majority. I mean, there's that stalwart diversity word, minority. But what does minority mean? When 50 U.S. cities, minorities are majorities. 10 U.S. states, white men are a minority group. 
And this summer, in the state of California, Latinos hit a benchmark milestone. In the most populous state in the union, Latinos became the largest ethnic group in, the United, in that state. Now, listen carefully. I did not say the largest ethnic minority group, but the largest ethnic group surpassing whites. This is an upside-down diversity. To be a minority is to be a majority. To be a woman is to be rising in opportunities. Now, why do I say that when women are still only earning 80 cents to the man's dollar? Only 4% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Only 15% of senior management in those Fortune 500 are women. I say it because more women than men are getting undergraduate degrees. In fact, by 2015, two-thirds of undergraduates will be women. More women than men are getting graduate degrees. Of the 15 fastest jobs in the United States, 13 are already female-dominant. So to be a woman is to be rising in opportunities. Diversity is upside down. To be disabled is to be differently abled. Because what does it mean to be disabled when in the 2012 London Olympics there was a sprinter with no legs, and it was not the Paralympics? There's a Scandinavian software co uh, quality check company that hires for the competence of autism, because they need people with the skills of photographic memory recall and obsessive attention to detail that can spot the error in millions of lines of code. I was at a financial software company in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is very committed to disability diversity. And you walk into their campus, and there are dozens of people in wheelchairs, dozens of people who are blind, and dozens of people who are deaf. And they're doing jobs such as research and development, legal, sales, communications, HR. And the most accurate proofreader is someone who is blind. So to be disabled is to be differently abled. Diversity is upside down. To be out is to be in. When the largest employer in the United States, a long-standing conservative institution called the U.S. military, says that you can be brave and loyal, courageous and strong, willing to die for your country and be gay, and repeals Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that be it begins a massive cultural revolution in the United States, not only in the military, but in mainstream America. Since then, I would argue, it's no coincidence that now over 50% of Americans are supportive of same-sex marriage. The sitting U.S. president is also in support of same-sex marriage. And many uh, referenda in states and cities now for the first time are, again, supportive of same-sex marriage. And the U.S. Supreme Court weighs in, declares Proposition 8 unconstitutional, and also DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, unconstitutional. So to be out is to be in. Diversity is upside down. So how to thrive in upside-down next-generation Diversity. I'm going to leave you with three things that you can put into practice right away after this day. For one, make a distinction between diversity and inclusion. Because I've been talking about how diversity 1.0 is outdated, and you might be thinking, yeah, you know, diversity, it's too loaded with baggage, too much just about race and gender. It is about compliance. Maybe inclusion is a new diversity. But I like both words, and I like diversity, but it needs to be freshened up, and I love the word inclusion, but these are two related but different things. What is diversity? What is inclusion? I like to say that diversity is the mix. And inclusion is making the mix work. Because you can have diversity, you can have the mix, but it may not be working very well. Or you may have inclusion, but not much diversity. And we need strategies that bring diversity in the door, but also make that mix work. And the other reason why I like this definition is it allows each community to define what the mix is for them. What is your mix, Indianapolis? What is your mix, Indiana? What is your mix? Midwest, USA, China, Brazil, Peru, and allows us to a more authentic conversation around our mix and how well it's working as opposed to something imposed from the outside. Second, we need to be thinking about diversity in a multidimensional way. So much of diversity 1.0 has been unidimensional, hasn't it? Black, Latino, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, female, male, with disability, without. But we are more than just one identity, aren't we? I mean, we can be we have our gender, we have our sexual orientation, we have our, our ethnicity, we have our race, we have our nationality. We have our generation that we're from, we have our personality, we have the things that we're good at, the things that we love to do, and we are a variety of these different things in combination. In fact, who am I? Well, let me count the ways. I can be Chinese, I can be a woman, I can be a millennial, I can be a single parent. Right? I can be a man, I can be British, I can be with a disability, I can be gay. 
and so on and so forth. You can combine these boxes horizontally, vertically, and diagonally in actually infinite ways. And every single one of you sitting here, you are a combination of these identities, including those of you who have been traditionally 1.0 majority. You also are diverse in a multidimensional way. And this leads to new blends that we have need to address. We can have the gay veteran exer. We can have the extroverted person with a disability, the millennial female manager, right? The boomer African American general manager with adult kids. The lesbian single mother, the immigrant woman Muslim engineer, the working single dad executive, the white male minority. Diversity, one that all, does not have answers to this complex reality. If I am black and gay, which affinity group do I go to? The black group doesn't understand my gayness. The gay group doesn't stop my blackness. So we need to address multidimensionality in our diversity. And third, we need to look at diversity as a skill and not an attitude. I can be authentically open to difference. I want it, but yet not have a clue about how to move it forward. Because inclusion is a skill. Which one is it? Is diversity a good thing? Two heads better than one, or too many cooks spoil the broth? Diversity champions like to cite statistics that show and studies that diversity is a good thing. That it leads to greater creativity and innovation. But here's the problem. There's equally compelling studies that show that diversity is not a good thing. It leads to more difficulty and conflict and chaos in the workplace. Friction, productivity suffers, lawsuits go up. So which one is it? Is diversity a good thing or not? An interculturalist by the name of Dr. Milton Bennett said, you know, these are credible academics on both sides of the equation. There must be an explanation for why they're coming up with opposite conclusions. So he read the literature, and he had his eureka aha moment, and he came up with this picture, and I'll walk you through it. In the middle is benchmark average performance, of monocultural teams. And the studies show that diverse teams either outperformed homogeneous teams or they underperformed them. What was the difference? The difference was that there was a clause missing in the middle of the sentence. Usually the sentence goes like this. Greater diversity leads to greater creativity and innovation. The clause missing in the middle sentence, greater diversity, when managed well, leads to greater creativity and innovation. That diversity all by itself is more conflictual. The invisible parts of the iceberg crash into each other. People don't know what's going on. The judgments fly. Productivity suffers. Now, before I move off this slide, one more thought about monocultural teams. Originally, the studies did look at monocultural white male groups, and they were trying to see if diverse teams, you know, women and people of color, would outperform or not the white male groups. And sure enough, they did or not, according to the pattern that I have here. But then they started saying, well, what if we made it all female, made it all Latino, or black, all gay? And this pattern still emerged. It didn't matter what the organizing homogeneous principle was. They were either outperformed or underperformed based on whether the diverse teams were managed well. So it was not just a white male thing. It was a homogeneous issue. And let me give you an example of how we need to be self-aware of who we are in relation to other people. There's a concept called, in cultural work, about whether we come from a culture that believes that we control the environment around us. And those are referred to internal control cultures. And external control cultures believe they cannot. They're more rooted in, you know, fate. And listen to the language and messages we hear on mama, mama's, or mom's knees as we're growing up. This is the language of internal control culture. Pull yourself by your bootstraps, tame the wild west, and God helps those who help themselves. Now contrast this to the worldview that shows up growing up on mama's knees in a culture rooted in Latino Catholic fatalism. <laughs> Dios quiere, God willing, inshallah. Que será, será. What will be, will be. And if I show up late to Indianapolis International Airport when it's time for me to leave, and I miss my plane, I will not say the Spanish equivalent of I miss the plane. What I would say is, el avión no se dejó, which in English means, the plane left us. <laughs> no sé qué pasó, pero ya se fue. I don't know what happened, but there it went. <laughs> An extra sense of outrage that how dare that community, community of people I'm supposed to be a part of leave me behind. So diversity and inclusion right side up, it's all about me, it's all about them, all about us. We get the them part. I want to learn all about those people that are not like me. I, I want to be enriched. Good for you. But don't forget the me part. What do you believe 
Why do you believe it? Where do you, that belief come from? And this includes all of us, including white males. You have to be able to answer that question so that when you interact with those who are different, you can then do a compare and contrast between what you prefer, what you don't like, what you gravitate toward, and what you tend to judge, and what you tend to affirm. And then see where you are similar, and you will be in many ways, profoundly, in the ways in which you are different. And then we can move into all about us. Not enough to celebrate difference. Not enough to appreciate difference. Not enough to tolerate difference. But it's about being able to say, I need your difference, and you need mine. And once we get to that place, we will be able, through next generation, right set up diversity, have compelling answers to the vexing questions of an upside-down world. Muchas gracias.